So the United States was finally clawing its way out of the worst economic recession it had ever seen. But because of the tax on Pearl Harbor, now our country was reluctantly being sucked back into World War II. It's at that moment the CEO of Coca-Cola, Robert Woodruff, said, hey, this is a proclamation I'm going to make. I don't care where in the world our brave service women, women and men are going to be, they are going to be able to get a taste and a comfort of home in the form of a bottle of Coca-Cola for the exact same price they pay at home, five cents. And it doesn't matter how much it's going to cost us as a company to make that happen. So the military runs with this, right? This is great. Um, but now Coca-Cola is part of the defense industry. So they are actually now exempt from the sugar and caramel rationing that's happening all throughout the world war years, right? Which severely is hindering all the soft drink industries during that time, right? During the years of World War II, Coca-Cola got five billion bottles of its product into a demographic that it was already starting to lose to a resurgent competitor called Pepsi-Cola that was positioning itself as a choice for a new generation. At the end of World War II, by the end of World War II, Coca-Cola had built 64 brand new international bottling operations, largely subsidized by the military. Okay, fast forward to today, Coca-Cola does up to 60% of its revenue every year outside of the United States, right? And the, you know, the trademark script, and the, the bottle logo, these are the gold standards when it comes to global brand awareness. And you know, to the chagrin of most culture anthropologists, Coke has got to be the most recognized and understood world, uh, word in the whole world. It's kind of a bummer. <laughs> Robert Woodruff is what I call a give-getter. Coca-Cola got ahead by giving back. In its heyday in the early 2000s, Krispy Kreme Donuts grew to become the third most recognized brand in the United States. And it did it without spending a single penny on paid TV, print, radio ads, or product placements. Instead, it did it by offering the most generous school fundraising program in the country, as well as donating all opening day profits from their stores to large local charities. And it, it probably doesn't hurt that their business model somehow infused the addictiveness of crack into like <laughs> butter and dough and sugar, which don't cost very much, right? But you hit that light, you gotta get there, right? So now, just for you guys wondering, the first and second place brands, just a couple slouches you, you might have heard of, um, that routinely spend hundreds of millions a year in their marketing. Krispy Kreme got ahead by giving back. In 1976, uh, Warren Buffett and his partner in a fledgling Berkshire Hathaway, they absolutely violated an SEC guideline and rule. They didn't actually understand it, they didn't know about it, but they flat out, they, they violated this thing. So um, they, they admitted to all wrongdoing, uh, they, you know, basically said, you know, we will cooperate. They actually cooperated with the SEC and its lawyers without any legal defense in the room. Very unusual, right? Um, and they, they agreed, we will do anything and everything, any penalty you have for us, we will go ahead and, and do that. Just please don't mention Warren Buffett, his partner, or Berkshire Hathaway. Because that early in their careers, that would have been the death knell for them, right? Well, the judge um, and the prosecutor, who the prosecutor just hates people like this, but they took a look at war particularly Warren Buffett's, even at that point, long-standing history of basically being involved on uh, charity boards, generous donations, active volunteerism. So they basically say in their court ruling, that, listen, this guy's an upstanding guy. And so they gave them the proverbial slap on the wrist. Two days later, Warren Buffett gets appointed to an SEC blue ribbon panel to specifically help companies to better comply with the rule that he broke. <laughs> so this took Warren Buffett from a relatively unknown investor and made him a national player. Okay. Warren Buffett got ahead by giving back. He's a give-getter. Now, after I've been in business for about two or three years, uh, this was really something I needed to hear because I realized at that point I wanted my cake, I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. I wanted to succeed by being a generous person and without having to be you know, a, a shark, stab your people in the back, uh, you know, cutthroat snake in the grass. I just, I just didn't want to do that. Right? But the problem is, you know, up until I, I started all this research and the framework, starting to understand the mechanisms behind it, as a strategist, every single business strategy that I had learned and, and studied, every single one of them had as the underlying assumption that I could actually excel at being a mean and cutthroat person. And I was just never gonna be very good at that at all, right? Also, in you know, developing leaders for over 20 years, one thing that I know is true is that our truest self is always our best self, right? So, you know, if I was gonna use a business strategy 
that required me to be kind of mean and cutthroat, I was at best, I mean at best, gonna be just slightly above average because it's not my true self, right? Because no matter what we do in life, there are three phases to our growth. Okay, so the first one's kind of like, uh, you know, you're, you're acclimating, you're just kind of, you're surveying the landscape, the environment, the culture, you're just trying to figure out how to survive. So it's kind of like you entered a world of like, oh, hey, how, oh, we don't do that? Oh, you guys are doing some weird stuff. You, you're doing this? Oh no, oh, I have to do my right hand, okay. So this is our culture now, okay. So that's phase one, you're just kind of surviving, right? But then you hit phase two and you start to see, hey, you know what? That person looks really good at their job. They seem smarter than all you all. So I'm gonna go check, check out what's going on over here. And you realize, oh, you don't do this? Oh, what do you do? What do you do? Oh, you, you do a straight line and a, a triangle. Okay, that's a little weird, but we'll roll with it, right? So this is phase two, you're mimicking. You're, you're mimicking people that you think are excellent. And most of us stall out in phase two because I mean, look at it, it's special enough, right? <laughs> You're actually pretty good at it. I mean, you're actually pretty good at it, right? And it's definitely above average. I mean, there's people over here like, really? Like, come on, we're, we're over here, folks. We know, we know what we're doing, right? But most people, again, will stall on their phase two, and it's just not okay because it's not our truest self, okay? And the reason it's important to reach our truest self, phase three, is that this is where you start to find um, mastery, innovation. It's when you start doing stuff that is actually unstoppable. Right, and you're just welcome here. Hey, you know what, try to do what I'm doing. Go ahead. I actually don't know what it does to my brain, the fact that I can do this and talk to you. I don't actually know what's going on, but so I'm gonna stop right there. But do you get that? That's the point where you start to reach mastery. And so if you're in this room and you're feeling like, man, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think I'm hitting mastery, it's because you're not in your phase three. Because again, our true self is our best self, right? Now, you know, so for me, I just realized my, whatever business strategy I'm gonna use, however I'm gonna skin that cat, it's gotta foundationally have generosity at its core because that's my true self. That's the best chance I have at attaining mastery in my phase three. And so the same might be true for you too, right? Now the other reason I love getting help by giving back is I'm just a huge fan of hacking things in life, right? What's not cool about trying to figure out a smarter, faster, maybe easier way of doing that? And we all know in business, okay, that people prefer to work with people they like, trust, and respect. I'm just telling you strategically, there's no quicker or surer way to win all three than generosity. It's, it sounds like common sense now, but it's not very easy to do and most people don't do it. Now, it just so happens that in the world of business, uh, there's a really neat tool it, that we can actually teach people and start to analyze how capitalism works. And it's called Monopoly, okay? So don't laugh. And then the national, in the national championships, when you start to see who ends up winning this kind of very fun, but very cutthroat game, right? I don't know if you've, still resolving stuff with your family from the way the early Monopoly <laughs> years, right? Uh, we're still working stuff out in our family. Um, but you can start to analyze things, and, and if we look at the people that win, I mean, look at just the winners, right? That's what we're about here, is you start to see a phenomenon I call competitive buoyancy. So what ends up happening is everyone starts the game out, and they're, all, they're, they're smart kids. They know how to do math, they know how real estate works. They're not, gonna be, they're not gonna be in the national championships unless they're smart kids, right? So that's the entry fee to get in. But as the game starts thinning out and people start, you know, in the, in the beginning, everyone wants to win, right? And in life, that's the same way. And as we should, we should all try to win, right? But as it starts to thin out and people are like, oh man, I thought I was smart, but that gal, man, she just cleaned my clock. And so as the games, the board starts thinning out and people start, you know, becoming the, the first or second place loser or whatever you want to call them, right? The, the thing, they start to change their mindset and saying, you know what? I'm probably not going to win this thing. Um, but... I'm st as, and as, as it gets fewer and fewer, those competitors towards the end, they start to realize they have the powerful ability, maybe even an obligation, to decide who wins that game. And this is, and this is the capitalist that goes on. This is the competitive buoyancy. They start to say, you know what? It doesn't look like I'm gonna win. Kind of a bummer. I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to put that on my resume. I'm not gonna get into Harvard or whatever you get for being a national champion at Monopoly, right? But as they start going, like, I'm not gonna win, but you know what? I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna make sure Everything, whatever I have you know, left in me, I'm gonna make sure it's not that guy, because he's a jerk, <laughs> right? He's, he's mean and he's cutthroat, and no one likes him. Mean people suck, right? But you know what? If, if I have some cards to play here, and if I'm gonna consolidate my properties to help someone win, I'm gonna choose this lady, because she was just so cool. She's been fair and smart, and she was even just like nice. She let some of us skate on our rent because we just didn't have stuff. She, she seems like a fair dealer. She's like a generous person. If someone's gonna go down as the winner on record, I want it to be that lady. You see how it works? 
So inevitably, when you look at, I mean, uh, uh, you know, just trust me, let's read the book or whatever. <laughs> when you look at the winners, right? Again, they all had to be smart, but they were the fairest and they're the most generous of the bunch. It's counterintuitive, right? It's competitive buoyancy. So, and so the cool thing is, so we talked about like, okay, if you're being generous and you're a generous person, you're now in your phase three. It's the best chance you have of being really, really good at something. And then you got this thing called competitive buoyancy. Right? And so a lot, you know, the, what I'll talk about, and this is kind of like, we just talked about physics. This is uh, borrowed from a physics textbook. This is your typical nerdy, uh, what they call buoyancy diagram, right? So it's pseudoscientific, because I made up the bottom arrow and the top arrow. But the, the whole point is that the upward arrows are so much bigger than the downward forces that it kind of keeps this beautiful, what I call give-getter orb, and it helps it rise above the fray, right? And what's happening is you're in your phase three, and you also have now competitive buoyancy. So basically, the general public, even your competitors, generos generosity is forcing them to like, trust, and respect you. And now you get this one more phenomenon. There's a lot of great research on this, where basically, if you know someone is generous, we all assume that that person is a better leader, more successful, and more trustworthy than the average person. Anyone gonna argue that? Right? And so what's, what's even more interesting is that they've studied people that start in the same place. And then this person didn't have any money, hardly any more than this person, but they were just being generous with what they had. The general population, again, will look at that person and go, that person is a better leader, uh, more successful, and trustworthy. And so that person actually starts to be more successful. Right? That phenomenon continues to validate and propagate the success for that generous person. So here's the thing. If you're, just, if you're choosing between me and someone else in business, you know, and you know that I'm consistently generous, you're going to think that right away, I'm more successful, I'm more trustworthy, and I'm a much better leader than the other person. It's a no-brainer. You're going to choose the more generous person, right? And so this, this is kind of the upward force in that. So you think, OK, that, that's, that's great. <laughs> you know, we've got three powerful forces. Well, the question you know, we always get at this point is June. That's fine and dandy. But how come not every generous person I know is really wildly successful in business? And it's a two-part answer. Number one is just simply what we stated. Most generous people are stuck in their phase two. They're trying to win in a very vicious, dog-eat-dog, stab-each-other-in-the-back kind of world with a, with a strategy that doesn't fit who they are. So at best, they're going to just kind of be above average in that strategy. It's an ill-fitting strategy. So answer number one, if you're a generous person, Switch your strategies. Your core assumptions in those other ones are that you can be a mean and cutthroat person. If you can't do that, you've got to use a different strategy. Right? So that's answer number one. Part two, and I'll be a little more sensitive to this because people take this the wrong way, but part two is simply that um, most generous people are annoyingly positive. Okay? <laughs> so what comes along with that is that if they're annoyingly positive, what tends to come with that is that Oftentimes, there is like this karmic assumption or resignation that as long as I'm you know, kind, nice, and generous, that it'll somehow all magically come back to me in a timely and profitable manner. Okay? So the problem is, that's just not, I haven't seen that to be true. And even if it was, it's not a reliable way to do business. Okay? So what I would offer, and again, I'm going to channel my inner nerd. Hey, listen, in my phase three, I'm super generous, but I'm also super nerdy. You know, you don't graduate with a molecular biology degree from UCSD without being a hardcore nerd, okay? So um, in, in nature, there's this really simple but powerful kind of metaphor or tool called the lens. And the, what lenses do in nature and science is they help focus energy and they provide clarity. So if you're a generous person and you're not seeing the success that you think you should have or whatever, it, you might need to use a lens, right? And so the lens is just a powerful acronym, right? These four things. You want to do a robust phase three version of leadership your expertise, your network, and your systems. Again, a phase three version, your version of those things. Because all of those work together to consistently leverage generosity in very tangible ways. So if you're a generous person, the leadership weak point I'm gonna see is that you avoid conflict, you're just a super nice person. Okay, if you wanna be a leader, you're gonna have to deal with conflict. You're gonna have to do a difficult conversation well. That's it for leadership. If you're, if you're a generous person, when you woke up this morning, you probably didn't think you're an expert, but there's probably maybe a couple hundred people on the earth that know exactly what it is you know. So one, you gotta believe that, and then you gotta learn to talk to people in a way that's not intimidating or confusing. Because both of those, that's not how real experts work. People that intimidate and confuse you are people that want you to think they're an expert, but they're not really experts, right? Now when it comes to networking, generous people often just have huge networks. 
My question is, do you have a network of the right people? Are you rejecting the wrong people? Are you always seeking out mentors? Are you always seeking out protégés? In this room, there's, there's probably both kinds of people for me here, right? And when it comes to systems, this is where generous people, this is probably the second most important thing for generous people, but it's the, it's, it's the boring part, but it's the part they never get around to. It's, do you develop a system? Do you bundle all of your tasks together in a process? Do you bundle all those processes together to build a system? Because if you have a system, you have repeatable success, now generosity is going to be a huge accelerator for your business. Right? So my friends, I really, really encourage you, and I hope that you find your phase three soon. And I really hope that you, will, you work on building a strong lens. And I really look forward to and excited about hearing your stories of how you've gotten ahead by giving back. Mean people suck, give-getters rule. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>